Chapter 30 of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Greater Rumania. Bucharest, the capital of Rumania, a city of three quarters of a million, which had only 300,000 at the close of the World War. The capital of a country which has 17 million people and which is as large as Great Britain and Ireland, twice the size of New England and bigger than New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland all joined together. A city of hovels and palaces, a city of great white villas and beautiful gardens shaded by tall forest trees and adorned with statues and fountains and all the settings of the luxurious rich. A city of the poor, fringed with miserable shacks in which live half-clad gypsies and their naked babies. A gay city, a pleasure-loving city, a city where license is said to run riot and love affairs are as unrestrained as those of ancient Rome or the wicked Paris of today. In short, a pretentious, ostentatious, overdressed municipality in the midst of a nation of peasants. The artistic effects of Bucharest delight the eye, and after the stone roadways and cobbles of other Balkan capitals, its new asphalt streets soothe the soul. Bucharest has long avenues of fine homes and several large parks. One wide driveway the people call the Little Champs-Élysées. It is a half mile longer than the avenue between the Place de la Concorde and the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, and is lined with old forest trees. On the bridle paths bordering it, a crowd of equestrians trot back and forth. The pavements are filled with a gay throng on foot. On the main roadway, richly dressed women and men roll along in carriages pulled by fine horses and driven by coachmen dressed in green velvet gowns and caps, their brass belts shining like so much gold. There is a sprinkling of automobiles, the best of the cars of America, moving along with all the well-known makers of Italy, Germany, England, and France. Bucharest is fond of its title of the Little Paris of the East. It likes to think that the trees along this driveway are as fine as those of the Bois de Boulogne, and right in the center of the boulevard it has built an Arc de Triomphe. In the distance this looks like a gigantic structure of pure ivory, but when one nears it one sees that the ivory is beginning to peel and that gaping cracks are spreading apart the foundations. This stucco monument was erected at the time of King Ferdinand's coronation and cannot last, although it is now under repair. Unkind people say it is typical of the Romanian capital. All show on the outside and but little substance within. However that may be, the buildings here are beautiful. The houses are covered with decorations that look like carvings in limestone, but most of which were shaped with a trowel. The people love white, and the homes of the rich are snowy palaces rising amid green trees. The Byzantine architecture, with its curved domes and cupolas inlaid with colors, prevails. In the interior of the dwellings, the walls are painted or stenciled rather than papered, giving an effect that is surprisingly pleasing. The stores of Bucharest make a fine show. The goods are well displayed behind plate glass windows, and the shops seem splendid to one who has just come from Russia, Greece, or Bulgaria. Here, instead of the Greek letters, the Roman alphabet is used as with us, and one can make out the inscriptions. One can also gather the news from the papers and keep track of the operas, the theaters, and the moving picture shows. All the big cities of Central Europe are growing. Berlin has gained almost a million in population since the World War. Munich is bigger than ever before, and Prague has nearly doubled in size. Poor as Austria and Hungary claim to be, there are many new buildings in Vienna and Budapest, while as for Belgrade, it seems to have at work a thousand Aladdins who erect a palace or so overnight. I find new buildings going up also on all sides in this capital of Romania. An interesting thing about the new construction is that it is done largely by gypsies. These people do not like steady jobs, but will come in from their huts on the outskirts of the cities 
and take places as mechanics when wages are high. They are especially good bricklayers and masons. They work in gangs of 40 or 50, one gang taking charge of a house and building it according to specifications. The women toil as well as the men. They mix the mortar and carry it in buckets on their heads or shoulders to the masons. They wheel brick and stone in barrows and do all sorts of dirty, hard labor that no American woman could be bribed to perform. This morning I saw a gypsy woman sitting on a pile of bricks and nursing her baby, while another was filling a bucket with mortar. As I looked, the mother cut short the baby's meal and laying the little one down on the bricks, lifted the heavy mortar bucket to her shoulder and climbed the ladder. But who are these Romanians and where and what is their country? The answers to the questions might make volumes, but I can give you at least the main human interest facts in less space. If you will take your map of Europe and follow the course of the Danube to the Black Sea, you will find on the north side of that river and including its delta, the greater Romania. It is wedged in between Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Russia, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria, forming a block of land equal to eight Switzerlands or 20 Belgiums or Hollands. Its climate is more moderate in summer, but much colder in winter than that of our South. Through the treaties following the World War, Romania has doubled in size, and in natural resources it is now one of the richest states of Europe. It embraces a large part of the Carpathian Mountains, which have wide valleys and plains and plateaus. It has, besides, the great belt of black soil forming the delta of the Danube, which is as fertile as that of the Mississippi. In the past, this has been one of the great wheat exporting regions of Europe. Its crops compare well with those of the Mississippi Valley. It produces wheat, rye, barley, and oats, and it contains the corn belt of South Europe. It has also thousands of acres in tobacco, a crop that comes to more than 10 million pounds in a year. Romania is a land of minerals. Its oil fields are among the richest of Europe, and in the new territory gained by the treaties of 1919, there are coal, iron, and gold. There are also our forests so extensive that from them sufficient lumber can be produced each year to load a train reaching almost all the way from New York to Chicago. The country is well equipped with transportation facilities. It has enough railways to make a double track across the United States from Boston to Seattle, and its public roads would reach round the globe at the equator with several thousand miles to spare. By the Danube, it has access to all Central and Western Europe, and the Black Sea gives it a water outlet to the Mediterranean. The capital is the principal city, and there are about 10 towns with populations ranging from 50 to 100,000 people. For the most part, the Romanians are peasants living in an infinite number of villages, some of which straggle for mile after mile along the roads. The inhabitants of Romania number about 17 and a half millions, almost all of whom belong to a race distinct from their neighbors. Russia is Slavic, Poland is Slavic, and so are Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria. The Hungarians are Magyars, but they come from the slopes of the Caucasus and have no kinship with the Romanians. These people take their name from old Rome and claim that their blood is richly mixed with that of the Romans who overran this part of the world about 100 years after Christ and established a great colony at the mouth of the Danube. They conquered the Dacians, who were then living here, and who are mentioned in all the early Roman histories. The Dacia of the Romans was larger than the Romania of today. The conquerors imposed their language upon the people, and the tongue used today is Latin rather than Slavic, though it has some Slavic words in it. It shows a kinship to Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. It is said that when Romanians go to Italy, they can master the language within a few weeks. The people here are proud of their Roman origin, and the founders of Rome are among their national heroes. One of the monuments of Bucharest is a great bronze she-wolf, 
with the two naked babies, Romulus and Remus, feeding away, and a similar picture is engraved on the back of some of the paper currency. Though conquered again and again, the nation has always striven to maintain its own institutions and its own tongue. When the Germans dominated the country from 1848 to 1867, they tried to introduce the German language and culture, and the Hungarians attempted to magyarize the Romanians of Transylvania. Nevertheless, Romanian is now spoken by more than half the population and is the official language of the realm. I like it. It is one of the softest and most mellifluous speeches of the world. But nevertheless, some of the aristocrats here will use only French, English, or German. I dine every day in the restaurant of a fashionable club where the waiters speak French and English, and I hear that many of the well-to-do families of Bucharest converse with each other only in French. The highest-priced nurses are those who speak English. And this brings me to the matter of class distinctions. Before the World War, the Romanians were divided into two great classes. A small, rich one, which owned most of the country, lived in great luxury and had money to fling away, and a very large one which either had only tiny patches of land or toiled for the nabobs. Prior to 1918, more than 9 million acres, or half of the cultivated lands, were owned by 1,000 proprietors, and the other half belonged to 6.5 million peasants. There was practically no middle class. Many of the aristocrats lived in Paris, and their estates were managed by agents, mostly Jews, who sent the profits out of the country. The government was an oligarchy, which to a large extent it is today. There are nominal elections, but they mean only the ousting of one group of aristocrats so that another group may have a chance. Thus the peasants are still ground between the upper and nether millstones of the aristocracy. I am told that this condition is rapidly changing, however, and it is safe to say that in a generation or so, we shall see a gulf less wide between the white-collared, silk-shirted politician and the fur-capped, cotton-trousered peasant. The basis of the old aristocracy was land. Before the war, many of the great estates covered tens of thousands of acres. On some of them, the people were practically serfs, and on many, the owners did not farm the lands, but gave them over to peasants who paid money rents or half the produce. The peasants owned most of the livestock, they furnished most of the plows and other tools, and they erected a large part of the buildings. When the Great Revolution overturned the nobility in Russia and Bolshevism seemed about to sweep over Romania, the aristocrats, realizing that this would mean their total destruction, passed laws for parceling out much more land to the peasants. Only a small portion was to be reserved to the nobles. In all, more than five million acres, a tract about as large as Massachusetts, has been carved out of the estates exceeding 1,200 acres, and this is being distributed among the non-landholders and small farmers. In some of the provinces, the size of the holdings that may be retained by the rich is limited to 250 acres, and the allotments vary according to the character of the country. Of course, all the land taken from the nobles is supposed to be paid for, but the prices are figured on pre-war valuations and often on a paper rather than a gold basis. In fact, in most of the payments, no real money passes, the government giving the former owner of the land long-time government bonds, which may or may not be paid in the future. The land allotted to the peasant upon payment of the government prices is limited to small tracts of from 12 to 18 acres. A great deal of the land taken over by the government formerly belonged to the churches, the Orthodox Church owning by far the most. End of chapter 30